So uh, I'm off to Salon of the Silver of Piazza. Uh, this is one of our pro cars. Uh, it's car 24. It's a car that goes out daily. And uh, in the back of the trunk, we have uh, the, the, the equipment we need for our job. Uh, we have a medical bag that has a <coughs> CO2 canister and masks. So when we go to a call where someone may need oxygen, is having trouble breathing, we administer this oxygen until evac and paramedics come and they could uh, take care of the person. Uh, secondly, you can see inside this case, uh, there's a patrol rifle <coughs> we take out every day. If we ever have to use it, we just uh, have access to that, uh, yeah, the rifle itself. Officer Piazza is going to show you up front the inside of the uh, patrol car and the that we use. There's the back. The back, you can see. Yeah. Full plastic seat belts. Uh, you can't get in or out. There's no door handles from the inside of the car. You have to be let out from the outside. So once you're in the back, you're in the back. It's all attached one piece in the window. You can look. It's not very comfortable. There's not a lot of there's a lot of room to move around. For so the suspect. Yes. Once you're in, <laughs> once you're in there, you're pretty much in there. Uh, we also sometimes just hold some extra gear. That's a defibrillator. If you have a heart problem, uh, having a heart attack. Put that on you and it gives you the shock, it's like the hospital. So. Yeah, run license plates, we write our tickets to the computer. We have a radio, radio the headquarters. We also, all the cars have video cameras in them. Um, this one has a radar unit as well. You can see where the lights. Up interior on top. camera or an exterior camera? Uh, it, it's an exterior camera, it's right here. You want to look? No, no. You can see it, it records right over here. Okay. We get to watch it. If we do have a, someone in the back of the car, we have the ability to turn it around. Oh. So okay. we would record our transport into headquarters. Right. Uh, we have a PA system. As soon as you turn the lights on in these cars, the cameras activate, so they don't expect you to, to turn the lights on going to a, a, a core and remember to turn the camera right. on. It'll automatically come on. Also, the cars are outfitted with they have a body mic. When the camera comes on, you put either put it in your pocket or you have it on. The microphone uh, is very sensitive. You can even take, if this falls out, it still records with just this. And it'll record, and when we pull in the back of headquarters at any time, uh, it begins an automatic download process over, you know, like like a Wi-Fi type system. Yeah. Uh, same with the tickets. The tickets will go inside through Wi-Fi. They're all written on computers now. They're printed out. All right. We're, we're going to move the tour inside now. Yep. Any questions on any of the cars? I mean, we have four or five chargers. We also have uh, a few trucks. We have two patrol trucks, one's for a supervisor, one's a uh, spare car. That's a detective truck right there. Um, that's the ERU Hummer. And then we also have two motorcycles. At the end of the tour, you guys could be you guys will be released over there so you guys can see the uh, additional units. We have the motorcycle unit, the bicycle unit, the ERU unit. You guys could do the tours over there, okay? Thank you. All right, we'll go inside now? Yeah, come on. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, first and foremost, about a year ago, the village uh, was going through some ideas that uh, had budgetary problems. So they were thinking about the midnight tour. We usually have a desk officer at all patrol. Uh, at eight to four, we have a, a desk officer. Four to twelve, we have a desk officer. Midnight, they thought maybe we'll get rid of the desk officer, and we're gonna have two men on patrol, and all calls will be forwarded to county police department in Hawthorne. Uh, so they mulled around some ideas got whatever they needed in order and that's the the plan we adopted and we've been implementing that for over a year now and it's gone perfectly uh, so now there won't be a desk officer after 12 o'clock midnight doors about are locked the door, mm -hmm. exterior doors are locked from midnight to about 7 40 in the morning you won't find anyone inside the building so book there'll be patrol on the street and Westchester County all phone calls will be forwarded to that uh, office where they'll dispatch on their PA uh, on their system for the officers on the street and that's how they'll uh, if they have a call they run the calls that way uh, Westchester County will say um, you know Tuckahoe uh, respond to Main Street for a person who needs medical assistance all officers respond there and deal with the situation on hand uh, if you were to come here at 2 o'clock in the morning and you're feeling faint this red box that you see has a phone it has a direct line right to Westchester County's uh, office. And, what? and then they'll dispatch, so they like I said. The suspect, no, we, we, we deal with all that. All they are is the go-between. Oh. They're physically taking that body that we're missing <laughs> at the front desk uh -huh. and uh, giving we us that service. We still have access to the building. 
Oh, okay. We do, okay. we do building right. checks to make sure no one, you know, nothing's yeah, we happening. We just don't have that desk off to expedite yeah, the phone So we could bring you in and process you. If you got a hold you overnight, you'd be transferred to Bronx where they have a desk call. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Come in. Watch the steps. Upstairs, the village court. We're not going to go up there. Uh, that's where the village court is. That's where all the offices. Not that here. We're not going to go up. This is the front area. This is where you deal with the desk officer. If you have a walk-in report, if you're here to pick up a report, file a complaint, whatever you need, pick up an accident report. Uh, you know, they have bulletproof glass to protect the officers. Uh, everything handed is through a drop box. If something happens up here and two people start arguing or someone becomes unruly, they could drop the locks. Hit Mike. Just hit it. Drop them. You hear that? It locks all it locks all the magnets, so now you can't get out. Once you're in here, <laughs> they can keep you in and get officers to respond to keep you okay. inside the desk area. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So just come this way. A brief look inside of what kind of uh, yeah. arsenal the ERU team has and the police department's equipped with. Uh, yeah. as you see below there's patrol shotguns. Above here, you have the ERU have had their own personal uh, weapon uh, uh, M16s right? and M4. M4, and then like I said, all the types of equipment that they'll need and have access to in case of an emergency. Um, they could come in here, grab what they need, and then go back on patrol as soon as possible. Or ammunition, uh, spare you know spare weaponry. Uh, we have you know, pepper spray. Uh, ERU team has you know larger. Um, distribution they have the foggers that you see all the time when you watch the news um, they just got some new equipment in like I said at the end of the tour you guys can go sit uh, see the ERU team's table they'll explain some of the gadgets they got in the past years but everything is kept in here only people that have access in here are the police officers we have uh, swipe cards that's what I did uh, through the whole building only us have access no you can't just come in these are you know fire re uh, reinforced doors so of course. Right. <laughs> and like you even see stuff that's happening now like say in Baltimore where they protest uh, we have simple uh, we have riot, riot, gear, riot yeah. gear that we have individual bags, put on a helmet, long stick, and basically what you're doing is try to get people to comply on the street. You guys form in, uh, in the line and then try to move the people back just to get a little control. The big stick is just to actually protect you to keep a distance. Yeah. It's not for swinging, it's just to keep distance. <coughs> uh, go back to the breathalyzer. Sure. Uh, so uh, let's have an example of uh, while patrol was sent to a call involving possible uh, DWI person who's been uh, under the influence of alcohol after we uh, perform our observations of the individual and f do a standardized field sobriety tests and we uh, decide that the person is under the influence of alcohol uh, he'll come in and be processed in addition to that he'll uh, will perform a BAC test on him and check his blood alcohol content and basically this machine is uh, regulated and uh, and calibrated by the state and our department uh, I think twice a year and basically if you are brought in for under the suspicion of uh, being intoxicated and we have you blown to this uh, machine it will give you the blood content how many uh, you know how much liquor is in your system basically yeah this is the one that goes to court not the one you know the little one you see on the street on one on the street and people always say oh it's not admissible why are you give me that that's just a tool we use to try to figure it out we have different tools we have different tests to figure out the real you know you put under arrest for suspicion of dwi or dui whatever it is then you brought in here uh there's a whole extensive you know wait period observation period you know the specific steps you have to go through and like you said then the final test is this this is what you blow into this is where you go to court and you say or when you read in the paper the person's blood alcohol level you know is xyz you know uh, 0 0.12 point you know two four that's where you hear it that's from this machine so may, may a suspect uh, may a person Resisting. Yes, once you resist, yeah, it's worry. called a refusal. Right. Once you refuse to do this, you automatically lose your license that day. But you also get something called a refusal hearing. That's at the DMV with a specific, I believe it's a judge, it's or a judge. Uh, it's, uh, I haven't had one in so long. There's an office, uh, he has his attorney there, you're there, the judge is there. They have a refusal hearing. They make sure that all the necessary steps were followed and the proper procedure was taken and person was read. You're, you're read different rights. You read your DWI warnings that give you all the warnings if you refuse what happens. And the judge sits there and goes through your report with you. And you know the attorney will ask a few small questions. It's not a, a trial. And they'll ask you, you know, did you follow this procedure? Did you do this? Oh, I see in your report you did X, Y, Z. You did X, Y, Z. And that correctly follows the New York State mandate on how you have to do
do a DWI. So, okay, you followed all the rules and regulations, that's fine, uh, and the person still refused. Okay, so, you know, here the judge grants in the favor of the police department, you know, your license is now being taken away. Or if the person did not follow procedure and just said, yeah, you, you want to blow on this? And they say, no, all right, good, you're done. They'll say, okay, you didn't follow necessary procedure. I grant the license back until the trial. It's only until the trial if they're eventually, you know. So that's that for, you know, there's, with DWIs, there's state mandated steps. There's state, the tests are called the standard uh, field sobriety tests. They're standardized, so which means here in Tuckahoe, versus say Harrison, we give the same exact test on the street, the walk and turn, the uh, one-legged stand, uh, the HCN, the pen test, that's all uh, the same throughout all departments. Even across the nation. Yeah. So the West Coast, mm -hmm. East Coast, it's the same test so that it doesn't differentiate Swap at all. Yeah. Uh, secondly, uh, this test is, uh, like I said, it's scientific method. It's great. Uh, uh, so and once you blow into that and it pulls up the number, because it's calibrated and mandated by the state, so on and so forth, that's pretty much inks this. Yeah, that inks it. Okay. Uh, if you refuse, like I said, you go to DMV and you, you speak to a, a judge who will over here oversee the uh, actual case and then decide right then and there if you're going to uh, move forward from that step on. Uh, Officer Piazza is going to take, take you to the squadron one. I'll show you where we make this process. Uh, this is where we take the uh, person who is being brought in and gather information and pedigree. You bring the guy in. You would put him up against the wall. You would, you know, search him. You would take everything out of his pockets. You would take his outer jacket off just so he has, say, a T-shirt. Uh, when you search someone, no. You have two officers. You usually, have an officer standing with a camera standing, watching, and you have the officer searching just in case something happens. You have someone. Take a photo here. Well, no, no. You just you, know, you put a, you put their hands up against the wall. You give him a full search. You search their pockets, take anything they have out, money, everything, you put it down. Also, this is all recorded. That's why we do it in this room. So everything you see, the officer takes stuff out of the pockets, you put it down. They take, you know, uh, a sweatshirt off, their shoes, their glasses, jewelry, everything goes off, all their properties put there. Then they're sat down on that chair, and you can see right behind you, there's this hook to the wall. You handcuff one wrist to the wall so they can't get up and run away. Uh, someone's always has to watch them. Also, when you have a prisoner, your gun, we have a gun safe, we'll show to you. Your gun goes away. You don't want to process because God forbid they get out where you're doing paperwork with them. You don't want them to try to reach and be a struggle for a gun. Last thing you want is something like that. So your gun's away there. If they get really, um, if they're really not sitting still, but you still need them here, there's one on the floor where you could put um, leg shackles on you and you put the leg shackles through. Now they can't get up. They can't try to kick you if you're trying to get stuff. So you get their property, you uh, do a prisoner property sheet, you voucher all their property. You put down everything they gave you, including how much money. The prisoner signs off on it, reading it, that this is what I gave you. And when you return it, he has to re-sign it saying that he got everything back. So there's no, he stole this or we lost this. Mm -hmm. And you sit here, you would process them in, in our um, impact system. We would get all their uh, information. We would fill everything we need out. And then now we'll show you if we're done with them and then say we have to wait an hour for the judge or whatever, we have to wait for whatever. We would put them in the cell. We're going to show you the cell, and we'll sh also show you where we fingerprint them. But we're going to start at the front desk where everything begins. So this is all our equipment. We have cameras, as you can see. Cameras pretty much everywhere. We have the police entrance. Uh, like I just told you, we have a, a camera in the squad room. All right, we have cameras everywhere. We have, you know, the, it shows all the police cars. We watch our police cars because, like you said, there's a rifle. There is a rifle in the back, even though it's locked and secured. Mm -hmm. There's double locks on it. There's rope. You still don't want people messing with the cop cars. Um, so we have our lots on there surveillance, especially when we brought in the overnight. We like to watch the front of the building in case something happens. This goes up Main Street and down Main Street. This is behind. Here's all the entrances. That's the entrance you were at over there because we could buzz people in of our own department. Uh, here's a squad room. When someone's in there, the desk officer, we could we have the ability to blow it up. You know, you want to maintain, even though, the, even though there's an officer there, you still want to maintain a visual contact so you never know what could happen. Um, the entrances, you know, all the offices and the stairs. This is uh, what we call the hotline phone for felonies, missing persons, um, injured parties, something like that. If I pick this phone up, I can't even pick it up. If I pick it up and hold it, every department in Westchester County, New York State Police, New NYPD, um, Greenwich Police, uh, FBI, DEP, MTA, and one or two on the border of uh, Putnam. All departments have this phone. You'll hear me talk throughout this phone. You identify yourself, you know, um, we're station 39. We're station 39. We say station 39, Tucko, to all, all stations. Or if we have something that just happened, say a hit and run guy ran somebody over on Main Street heading that way. I would say special attention, Bronxville, Yonkers, Scarsdale. Uh, we just had a hit and run. You put out your description, whatever you need and all the departments say, we hear it. 
Many times it's worked. Robberies, burglaries going down south on 22. Uh, suspect fled in a white BMW going south on 22. You'd call us, Mount Vernon in Bronxville. Uh, yeah, Mount Vernon in Bronxville. And they would hear it, and they would get cars up, flood the area, flood mm -hmm. possible areas. And all of a sudden, white BMW flying, you have three, four departments can give chase, block roads, do whatever you need to do. This is Eastchester Police that we could scan. They're our closest. We share a frequency with Bronxville. We share. So we have to wait and take turns because we want to be able to hear them because they right there. But we also listen to Eastchester. Eastchester is our neighboring department. They're right there. Anytime they need help, we can just hear them. We don't have to wait for them to call. Large fight in progress right here at Mobile. We're sending units. We're hearing it. We're sending the units. This is our dispatch radio. This goes to our cars. And like I said, we share a frequency with Bronxville, so we, should, we wait our turns. Um, behind you. This is the fire department. We can hear what fire dispatches, because not all medical calls and not all fire calls come to the police department. We have an alarm system sometimes, the fire goes directly to fire control. So you'll hear it over the little pager that they're dispatching to an address in Tuckahoe. So we'll start sending our units. And then we also have, uh, this is our 911 system. So you pick up the phone. Hit priority, and he'd say, you know, Tucko Police 911, what's your emergency? And then you would start, you'd begin talking to the person and get whatever you need from them, right? And if it say it's a medical call, you're able to transfer. We would click this, and we would click that, and we tra we double click that, and we would transfer the call up to 60 County Control, and they would dispatch fire, and they dispatch ambulance. They also ascertain further medical information that we don't, you know, we don't ask those questions. Uh, the things that they need to uh, get. But yeah, as you can see, the address and the phone number pops up. Because say you call 911 from your house and someone makes you hang up that phone, we still have your address. We're calling back, we're calling back, we don't get you, we're sending officers anyway. So even the 911 system has uh, stuff like language barriers. Again, someone like speaks Spanish. Uh, you can just basically click on their tab, it'll go directly to someone who understands Spanish and help translate what's the problem so we could send officers to that location as soon as possible. There's poison control on here and some other uh, tabs that you could just work through. But most of the time, if it's a call where someone, just say, for example, needs medical attention, we'll expedite our officers there quickly. And the same token, we'll push the call, we'll forward it to 60 Control up in Valhalla, which has their little system where they'll kick out evac and fire to that location where they're more that are equipped to help that person. Um, so that's the 911 system. I'm gonna walk outside to the hallway and we're gonna probably show you actual prison. And and just take it to the back, we're gonna show you the live scan and the thing, but just real quick, when we get evidence, these are evidence lockers. Uh, this obviously would be for large objects, say uh, rifles, somebody. So people even come in to turn in their rifles. Uh, police officers are going from active to retired. Sometimes there's a delay in them getting their uh, license to hold the guns. So they would come in and say, hey, do you mind until from this date to this date until I get my license to carry and have my weapons, uh, can you hold them for safekeeping? And the detective bureau will do that. So you'll have some rifles and stuff in here and you put it in here. Or if you just get you know regular evidence, drugs, whatnot, you voucher it, you put it in here, you lock it, you take your key out, and you drop it in the hole. So no one can get into it. No other tour, no one else can mess with the evidence. It's a chain of custody. It would go from me, the, the vouchering officer, the only people that really have these keys, the detective bureau. They have the, the opposite of this key. So they would come Monday morning. We have evidence for the weekend right here. There's something in here. So they would come in the morning. They would open the, They would open these up. They take whatever evidence and all the sheets that are in there. They take the case folders. They would mark the chain of custody into them, and then they would begin processing uh, evidence of whatever cases holding over. Everything, there's a chain of command for everything because they need to know who touches the evidence at what time. So you can't say something was added or taken away from the evidence because I say this is what I put in the bag at this time and I locked it and secured it at this time and that's it. And then the next person signs off that they're opening it. So they say, no, that wasn't there. It was officer vouching it, detective took it out. When we go into the cells, we don't have our guns on us. Uh, again, same thing with the squad room. You don't want to fight to break out. It's a small confined area. You don't have a lot of room. So if a fight breaks out, you're very tight. You know, also, you don't want accidental uh, rounds to go off if they grab your gun, squeeze the trigger. You know, it's a very tight area. So you, you secure it here, you can lock it. We know the code and you come into the cells. We have three cells. The first cell you can see is a female cell. The female cell is a little bit different. Um, here, I'll just turn the light. 
The female cell is, um, we have a solid door, shut, um, partition, it's a mainly male department. Uh, females get the privacy. If we do have a female, we have a female matron that stands by. If they need anything, the female can talk and look in because it's female on female. Um, if anything's needed, they can hear them. But we don't video record them because, like I said, they're females and uh, most of us are males. These are the cells. We'll put the males in. We have three of them. They're all identical. You guys can fill in. As you can see, they're not very comfortable. They're uh, <laughs> They're small, right? They're small and minimal. <laughs> yeah, they don't look very comfortable. You have a sink, you have a cup, you have some toilet paper, and you have a bathroom. You're held here. All three cells are on video and audio. We can see you and hear you on the desk. If you're in the cell, we pull up the cell on the desk and we keep an eye on you, and we can hear you. If you need something, hey, I need something, or how much longer, or help, I don't feel good, whatever the case may be, or we want to tell them, uh, you know, if they're here for an extended period of time, they get food. Are you hungry? You know, it's meal time. They'll say, some guys say, no, I just want to sleep. Some guys say, yes, please, bagel or pizza, whatever we get them. Uh, close the cell, it automatically locks. Also, uh, we do a desk log, there's a log. As soon as someone's put in a cell, every 20 minutes they have to be checked on. Even if they're sleeping, you gotta make sure they're breathing, make sure they're alive. You don't wanna turn around and someone had a heart attack, you don't know. Six hours later, the judge is here, you gotta wake him up and he's passed away, you don't want that. Or you know, they act a little funny in the cell, you have to just check on them. You gotta make sure they're okay. Um, you're gonna follow Officer Solano pretty much the end is gonna be the live scan when we fingerprint. All right, so lastly, uh, after someone, if you can remember, squad room one is where the, the officer brings in the person to be fingerprinted, uh, not fingerprinted, to be searched and gathers information. After we gather all that information and if the person has to be fingerprinted for whatever reasons, the crime he's committed, we'll take him into this uh, little small room and this machine that you see before us is where we actually input the person's information, all this uh, pedigree that associates him, social security, weight, height, eye color, so on and so forth. Do you ever see the mugshot? You see if someone's mugshot, they'll show you a picture of a mugshot. We'll have him stand over here. There's a camera. We'll take the photograph. The photograph will superimpose on this uh, screen in here then the officers working will roll his fingerprints and as you know fingerprints are unique to each and every individual and we'll do that and grab uh, this machine will grab the fingerprints upload them into the system and then be kicked into a database by FBI and that's how we could uh, solve crimes by you know people's fingerprints take photo here the photographs will be taken here they will have the person stand I think up against this wall, and there's a camera as you can see over here, and they'll just do a photograph of. Uh, do you have Maneco. something to show the height? Uh, you see that, you see that, but we don't. Uh. I, I, I'm not sure if there's anything like that on the picture, but basically we punch our pedigree in and information when they uh, first come in. Uh, we we ask them their height and weight. And then All right. That's it, right. And then they could probably walk outside yeah, to where the other. So think, take fingerprint over there. The fingerprints will be over here. And you don't use ink like it used to be no, like ten messy. years ago. They yeah. They, they, they get black fingers. They still use ink for financial uh, jobs. When you get a financial job, someone needs fingerprints. <laughs> they'll come in as a service. Uh, the department charges. I don't know how much money, but you can so come and get the fingerprints Right. This is computer. They wow. wipe it clean, and it goes around to. Uh, the image and get saved and uploaded no to the computer. Wave. It wave. So if we go right outside, you'll see the bike patrol that we have. ERU has a nice little table set up and the different types of equipment they use and they deal with it every day. Motorcycles. A motorcycle division. Patrol. And a bike patrol. So you can ask this way and see different types of uh, I have a motorcycle things that we have ready You should do. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions as we're walking? Out. Do you enjoy that, Ethan? Yeah. Anything yeah. with law? The fatal vision and DWI stuff, the ERU, the motor, uh, the bicycle and the motorcycle. Oh. Uh, so if you guys want to try you guys can go talk to your ERU team members right there. Popcorn! Popcorn! <laughs> 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 Yeah, these, uh, so these are all fully automatic weapons. This is a MP5, it shoots a 40 caliber. This is a 223 caliber uh, M4. 
shotgun, less lethal shotgun, which would shoot uh, beam bound rags, uh, beam bound rounds. And this is a 40 millimeter, so this shoots uh, basically like pepper spray or gas uh, for riot control, crowd control. Um, this is called a rabbit, it's part of the entry tools to put pressure on a door and uh, open up a door with the ramps that you see below. <laughs> Bolt cutters, obviously, if anything were to be chained, the doors were to be chained, you can uh, use those to open the, to, to break the chain. Um, more entry tools, breaching tools to, uh, to gain entry into a residence. 